Hello everyone, I'm Shimon Yu from Georgia Tech. It's my great pleasure to give this IEDM short course presentation on the topic of analog memory leads for AI. We will talk about the multi-level synaptic memory devices and their applications for computing memory hardware accelerators for machine learning. Here is the outline. First, we will start with background and motivation. And then we will survey the state-of-the-art synaptic devices. And then we will use a RM-based test vehicle to demonstrate the variability and reliability characterization at array level. And then we will show our DNN plus neural scene benchmark framework to compare different synaptic devices for inference and training. And then we will survey the recent chip level demonstrations. And finally, we will talk about the future trend, in particular, the monolithic 3D integration. AI applications have been prevailing in our daily life. Here are a few examples, from the self-driving car to the language translation on the fly to the biomedic image analytics. Most of those applications are powered by the deep neural network models. And actually, deep neural network have many kinds of topologies, from the deep convolutional neural network to the deep recurrent neural networks. So here on the right-hand side, we have a family of the deep neural network models, and we can call it the neural network zoo. In this presentation, we will focus on image classification, and we will use two representative data sets. First is CIFAR-10, second is more complex image net. This table, we summarized the popular deep neural network models in terms of the number of parameters, and also the number of operations. As you can see here, most of the networks may have a few megabytes to tens of megabytes memory, and this is representative for the image classification. But keep in mind, for other applications like language translation, the model size can be up to 10 gigabytes. Therefore, the Demand for the on-chip memory can range from tens of megabytes to tens of gigabytes. This trend may require the ultra-high density multi-bit memory and eventually 3D integration. Let's use convolutional neural network as example to illustrate the basics. So the neural network has many layers, and the channel layers will extract the low-level features. The extraction was done by the convolution between the feature map and the filters with the weights. As we go deeper to the neural network, the network can extract the high-level features, and eventually, the fully connected layer at the very end can associate those features with the labels. There are two operation phases. The first one is a training, that is an iterative process to use the backpropagation to update the weights from the arrows. And then after the training is done, then we can do the inference only, which only involves the feedforward propagation for prediction. As you can see, the training will be right intensive operations to the synaptic memory, and the inference will be read intensive to the synaptic weight memory. After all, the most intensive computation in both training and inference will be the vector matrix multiplication, and that is the task we are going to accelerate by the hardware. Here we show the hardware acceleration platforms. First, we believe GPU still dominates the training in the cloud, and we say FPGA is a good candidate for inference, especially for fast prototyping. And there is a new trend to develop TPU or similar digital ASIC for the machine learning. If you look at the energy efficiency in terms of the tera operations per second per watt, the GPU of FPGA can reach at most 0.1 TOPS per watt, but they can employ the floating point computation. Therefore, they are very flexible to the programmer and it can also reach very high accuracy. And the TPU or the digital ASICs 
typically employ the fixed point computation, and the efficiency can be boosted to 1 to 10 T ops per watt. But if we want to further improve the energy efficiency, especially considering the edge inference, where the power is very constrained, then we believe that the end approach using the computing memory paradigm is very promising. If we can employ the low precision calculation, we can further boost the energy efficiency to tens to 100 T ops per watt, especially when we use those multi-level analog memories. And we believe that the computing memory chip can also support the incremental learning with continuous, possibly unlabeled new data sets, such as the scenario in the reinforcement learning when deployed to the field. And we will focus on the computing memory with uh, analog memory in this presentation. Let's discuss the basics for computing memory. Essentially, it's a mixed signal compute where the memory array performs the analog computation and the peripheral circuits perform the digital processing. Let's take one layer of neural network model as example. So here the weights are mapped to a memory array's data pattern. And then the inputs are loaded in, in parallel to activate multiple VLAMs. So the voltage from the VLAM will be multiplied by the conductance of the memory. And then we create a current along the bit line which can naturally sum up multiple cells current. At the end of the column, we may need the ADC to convert the analog current to the digital output. And sometimes we may need the MUX to share the ADC among multiple columns. And sometimes we may need the digital shift and add to represent higher precision. For example, if the weight is 8 bits at the memory array, with only 4 bits per cell, then we may need two cells to do the shift and add and create the 8 bit weight. In terms of the memory cell, it can be either 6T S run or even 8T S run. And then we can also have the 1T1R, one transistor, one resistor implementation with the multi level memories, which can be this resistive element. Before we talk about the analog multi-level memory, we should keep in mind that the baseline for the comparison should be the SRAM-based computing memory, which is available at the advanced technology node today. And here we show one example of the AT rate decouple SRAM to do the computing memory. So here the data pattern at the storage node Q will determine whether we will have the discharge current from the bit line. And uh, when we turn on multiple VLAM, then depending on the data pattern, then we may have the discharge current or we may not have the discharge current from the bit line. So when we sum up the bit line current, it will naturally represent the bitwise multiply and accumulate operations. So in this year's ISCC, TSMC demonstrated a 7 nanometer SRAM based computing memory macro with very impressive energy efficiency. So here I have to emphasize that the energy efficiency should be normalized to the same weight precision and activation precision. So in this presentation, we will use 8-bit weight and 8-bit activation precision for the MAC operation. If we normalize the number from the table in this paper to the 8-bit by 8-bit MAC, it should be around 88 T ops per watt. In this slide, we're going to have a high-level comparison between the TPU-like digital accelerator versus near-memory compute accelerator versus in-memory compute accelerator. So in the TPU-like digital accelerator, there are many PEs, processing elements, implemented by the digital multipliers and adders. So in this case, both activation and weights are fetched from the global buffer. There are many on chip data movements associated with the both activation and weights. Well, in the near memory compute or the in memory compute, the weights are stationary. We only move the inputs 
and output activations around on chip. The difference here is that for the near memory compute, we are going to enable the memory array row by row sequentially. And we are going to use the digital accumulators to sum up the partial sum. While in the in-memory compute, we are going to activate multiple rows simultaneously, and we are going to use ADC to quantize the partial sum. As you can see, both the TPU-like accelerator or the near-memory accelerator, they are digital processing, while the in-memory compute accelerator is mixed signal compute, essentially. Therefore, there is a suspect that the in-memory compute may suffer from the noise and vibrations. Therefore, their computation accuracy may be degraded. We are going to discuss this in more details later. Now, let's survey the synaptic devices. Fundamentally, we get inspirations from biology and neuron science to develop the semiconductor devices to emulate the synapses and the neurons. And also, we want to fulfill the mathematical formulations in machine learning, such as the weighted sum and the nonlinear activation. So here, simple abstractions for device engineers. Synapses are the local memories that carry the weights. Essentially, we want the multi-bit memory. And we can think it's a variable resistor. It can be a two-terminal resistor directly, or it can be three-terminal transistor. If we bias the transistor in the linear region, it can be approximated as a resistor. And the neurons are simple thresholding compute units, and we believe the threshold switches are good candidates, which has the abrupt switching in its IV characteristics, and it will return to off state at zero voltage. Therefore, it's not a memory, but it's a switch. Here is the landscape of the analog multi-bit memories. First, we have the filamentary RM based on oxides, and here we can modulate the shape of the oxygen vacancy-based filament to tune the conductance. Second, we may have the non-filamentary R1 where we modulate the defect density between two regions to tune the conductance. Certainly, we may have the phase change memory where we can fine-tune the amorphous region volume to control the conductance. And finally, we have the ferroelectric field effect transistors where we can modulate the domain configurations in the gate stack to enhance or inhibit the channel inversion. Therefore, we can tune the threshold voltage of the transistor and then we can fine tune the channel conductance. So here, in principle, the partial switching of these materials leads to the analog multi-bit memory. And we see that R1 and phase change are more current-driven switching, but the FE FET is more electric field-driven switching. Therefore, Fe fat has the lowest energy to switch. In this presentation, we are not going to focus on the STT or SOT M run as they are binary snaps in principle. And also, we are not going to discuss about the EC run, electrical chemical random access memory, because it's premature. Before we dive into individual device candidates, we like to first discuss the key device properties desired for training. So here we identify the symmetry and linearity in the weight update as the most critical property that will affect the training accuracy. Ideally, we want the device conductance to be tuned in this linear and symmetric fashion under the identical pulse train. So we can potentiate the device conductance linearly and depress the conductance linearly. So the potentiation and depression can be symmetric. And here we may require larger than 6 bits precision for the in-situ training. But in the literature, many of the reported devices suffer from the nonlinearity and asymmetry in the weight updates. So here we show a behavior model for the normalized conductance versus the 
number of pulses. So here we label the nonlinearity level from 0 to 6. And then we perform the neural network simulation on the CIFAR 10 data set. And we see that the training accuracy quickly degrades over the nonlinearity level from 0 to 6 if there is a symmetry between the potentiation and depression. Fortunately, there are some recent work using the algorithm level techniques such as momentum to compensate for the accuracy loss. If you are interested, you are encouraged to refer to this uh, paper listed in the reference of this presentation later. Then let's talk about the key device property that matter for inference. So after the training, the weights should be stable over time for the inference, as the inference is read-only operations. But there are many non-ideal device effects that may affect the reliability for the inference. Those effects include the relaxation after the initial programming. The conductance may drift. And also, those drift may be accelerated under the rate of stress. And the retention at higher temperature is also a problematic issue. And then the intermediate state reliability is still the key concern. So here we show a generic drift schemes for the conductance as they drift to the maximum, drift to the minimum, drift to the middle, or they randomly drift. And here we perform a neural network simulation on the CIFAR 10 inference accuracy over time considering those different modes of the drift. And we see that the random drift can be most robust to the degradation of the accuracy, probably because those drifts compensate each other. Now let's dive into individual synaptic device in details. First, multi-bit R1. The key idea to enable multi-bit operations in the oxide R1 is to create multiple weak filaments instead of a single strong filament. As demonstrated by this group, by engineering the capping layer on top of the hafnium oxide, for example, tantalum oxide, it can reach hundreds of multi-level states with a symmetric and linear potentiation and depression. As you can see here, the variations are still large. But with the right and verified technique, it can tighten the distribution for at least 32 levels that represent 5-bit weight, as shown in this distribution. Second, multi-bit phase change memory. By using the MITAC manner, IBM recently demonstrates 1,000 levels that corresponding to 10-bit weight in the phase change memory. And also, this confined phase change memory structure also show good retention and endurance. One possible caveat here is that the dynamic range in the tuning is actually quite limited. And also, the reset of the phase change memory is abrupt, so you can only potentiate the conductance during the gradual set. Therefore, for the bidirectional tuning, we need to have two transistor, two resistor as one weight cell to do the differential readout. But by this technique, we can achieve quite symmetric and linear weight updates with two cells as one weight. ARA and phase change memory are still emerging memories. But don't forget about the mature technology, such as the floating gate transistor or the charge trap transistor. Here, UCSB's team has demonstrated down to 50 nanometer low E flash based synaptic array with the separate gates device structure. And also, UCLA's team recently demonstrated the charge trap transistor based weight cell using the Global Foundry's 22 nanometer FDSOI platform. So here, in general, the E-flash or the CTT-based solution has wide range for the current tuning. And the right verifier is typically used to fine-tune the current. 
but it should be pointed out that the right operation is pretty slow for those chat trap or the floating gate transistors. Therefore, this is good for the inference only, but not suitable for the training. As mentioned earlier, some of the language translation model may require gigabyte level memory, and we believe the 3D land is only ultra high density memory architecture. And there are recent proposals to modify the peripheral circuits of the 3D land to enable the computing memory. So, for example, here, our group has proposed to use the SSL select NAMs as inputs, and then we can do the layer by layer in memory compute in the 3D land using the bitnam as output. And also, the Macronix has proposed using the bitnam as input and then perform the layer by layer computation with the source NAM as output. Of course, there may be a need for the heterogeneous integration of the 3D land with the peripheral logic circuits by the stacking as a 3D NAND fabrication process is not compatible with the advanced logic process. FEFET is also a three-terminal synaptic device relying on the threshold voltage modulation to tune the channel conductance at a given fixed gate voltage. Compared to the flash, FEFET has more interesting attributes, for example, much faster programming speed down to tens of nanoseconds, and much smaller programming voltage down to 1.8 volts. And also compared to the other emerging non-volatile memories, such as R1 and phase change memory, FEFET has the lowest switching energy down to femtojoule per bit due to its electric field-driven mechanism. And recently, the doped hafnium oxide-based ferroelectric materials such as HZO have been drawing great attention in the IEDM community. And here in this slide, we show some of the results from Professor Suman Data's group, showing the multi-level capability of the in-situ training, as well as the distributions for the two-bit inference. Our recent research identified a challenge for the ferroelectric partial switching, that is a history effect, which states that the intermediate state switching not only depends on the current state, but also depends on the prior history that the device has gone through. For example, here we can see the polarization versus the voltage hysteresis, and we can consider a smaller loop, the red one, so we can start from the S0 state and then ramp up the voltage to the S2 state and then we sweep the negative voltage down to S1 state. And we can also switch the device using a larger loop, that is the blue one, from the S0 to the S3 and then S3 to the S2. Now from S2 to S1, we may need to use larger voltage along the larger loop from S2 to S1. So compare the two loops, the S2 to S1, although they have the same transition, but they have different voltages to switch, depending on the prior history. We have experimentally demonstrated this history effect in the HZO-based ferroelectric capacitor, as shown here as well as the Global Foundry's 28 nanometer FE FET. So this is indeed a challenge to deterministically switch the intermediate states. We can explain the history effect by the variations of the coercive fields of the multi-domain in the ferroelectrics. So here we can consider the domains with the larger coercive field as a harder domain. In the larger loop, because we have gone through S3 state, where most of the harder domains have been pointing down. Then in the S2 state, if we compare the, the larger loop versus the minor loop, then they have the same number of domains pointing up and pointing down. 
but the larger loop has more harder domains pointing down. Therefore, in the next transition from S2 to S1, we have to apply larger electric field to switch those harder domains. To mitigate this kind of history effect, we have proposed a programming scheme that is always erased before program. Therefore, we can rely on the saturation loop instead of the minor loop in the PV hysteresis to switch the devices. If we use this mitigation scheme, we can recover the accuracy degradation in the neural network training. So here we show a simple MNIST data set and with this fully erased before program scheme, we can reach 97% of the accuracy close to the software baseline. We talk about the synaptic devices, but don't forget about the neuron load at the end of the column, where it integrates the weighted sum and convert to the digital output. This CMOS neuron can be implemented by the integrand fire circuits or the ADC, but typically this kind of circuits will need tens of transistors, therefore they occupy quite a large space which is typically larger than the column pitch with the memory array. Therefore, multiple columns may have to share one CMOS neuron, and the throughput will be reduced since the parallelism is compromised. So here the key idea is to replace all those transistors with a single threshold switch devices, which can function as oscillation neuron. And here we experimentally demonstrate this concept with a small scale crossbar array with the niobium oxide threshold switch devices at the end of the column. The threshold switch devices has this kind of abrupt switching in its IV characteristics. And if we have this kind of device at the end of the column, then this node voltage can oscillate between the threshold voltage and the hold voltage of the threshold switch. And the oscillation frequency is represented by the weighted sum current. And here we demonstrate that by turning on multiple rows, the oscillation frequency can be tuned proportional to the weighted sum. And in this experiment, the oscillation frequency is limited to hundreds of kilohertz because of the prosthetic cap we introduced in the experimental setup. But in the integrated design, without the pad prosthetics, the oscillation frequency can be as high as gigahertz. Next, we will move on to the array-level categorizations for the variability and reliability using an RN test vehicle. The test vehicle is based on unbounds half length set R1 at 90 nanometer load, where the R1 is integrated between metal 1 and metal 2. We develop a 256 by 256 1T1R array with integrated decoder and level shifter for the multi-level characterization. Here I want to emphasize that the multi-level R1 for computing memory is different from that for storage. So for the multi-level R1, if we use it for storage, we care about the tail-to-tail -tail gap between two states. But for the multi-level R1, for computing memory, we care about the deviation even within one state, because we sum up the current from multiple cells along the column. Any deviation will be aggregated along the column. Therefore, we have very stringent requirements on the standard deviation of the distribution even within one state. To tighten RN's distribution, we need to use write and verify protocol. So here we show one example of the two loop write and verify. So the first round loop is the coarse grain tuning of the conductance. And the second round of the loop is the fine grain tuning. And eventually we can achieve the target range of the conductance. So with this approach, we demonstrated 3-bit RN for the compute. Here we split the eight levels 
linearly into this conductance range. And for each level, we test 4,000 cells. And we can achieve less than 1.5% sigma for each level. And here we show the distribution of those eight levels with the number of verified loop. And here, this is a very tight distribution. And we show the tail bits as well. After we write and verify the R run into multi-level states, we care about their stability for the inference. And here we show some of the reliability concerns. First is the relaxation after programming. So here we show the distribution of those four states. And as the time goes by, the distribution tend to relax, especially for the intermediate states, like the state two where it has a weak filament. And also under the read stress, the state two resistance tend to drift, especially at higher read voltage. And also at higher temperature, the state two conductance tend to drift. And also the sigma or fluctuation of this state two tends to increase over time. All of those reliability issues may negatively impact the inference accuracy. And this requires further device engineering to improve the stability, especially for the intermediate states. Now we will benchmark different synaptic devices and consider their pros and cons for the inference and training. We will introduce DNN plus Neurosyn benchmark framework developed by our group. This is an end-to-end -end framework that is interfaced with PyTorch and TensorFlow, which are the popular machine learning platform used by the software community. The Neurosyn core itself is a circuit model that is built upon a hierarchy of chip tile PE subarray with all the necessary peripheral circuitry. And we calibrate the technology parameters with the PTM model from 130 nanometer down to 7 nanometer. And the neural sync core can report the energy efficiency, throughput, area, and memory utilization. And then from the Python wrapper, we can define arbitrary deep neural network model and report the inference or the training accuracy under the hardware constraints. And here we show the GitHub link for the latest version for inference and training respectively. So this tool is open sourced and we have an active community with more than 100 users, including researchers from industry such as Intel, TSMC, Samsung, and SK Hynix. This slide shows the key features of the framework. The Python wrapper can define the neural network model and then we consider the non-ideal device effects that may affect the training or the inference accuracy. For example, during the back propagation stage, we can consider the nonlinearity and the symmetry in the weight update, as discussed earlier. And also, we can consider the device-to-device -device variation, cycle-to-cycle -cycle variations. In the feedforward stage, we can consider the conductance drift and also the ADC quantization effects into the inference accuracy estimation. And then from the Python wrapper, we are going to transfer the network structure to the neural sync core to automatically define the chip floor plan. And also we are going to unroll the real traces, such as the activations and kernels into the input vector and weight matrix that are mapped to the memory arrays. And then we're going to conduct the hierarchical simulations to generate the hardware performance using this kind of hierarchy. Here we show more details about the methodologies. On the algorithm accuracy estimation, we use a wedge method, where the weight, activation, gradient, and arrows are all quantized for the hardware compatibility. And also, we introduce a partial sound quantization based on the ADC precision. We can support various neural network models for CIFAR 10, 100, 
and ImageNet datasets. On the hardware estimation, we mostly use the analytical models that are calibrated with the space at the module level. For the analog modules such as ADC, we directly perform the custom design and run the cadence simulations to generate the report. And then for the digital modules, we estimated with the standard cell area, not gate delay, dynamic power, as well as leakage power. We also consider the interconnect based on H3, and we can estimate it, the prosthetic RC delay and power as well. So here we show one example of the chip hierarchy. On the chip level, we have multiple tiles and global buffer and the digital modules for the neuron function. And then one tile can compose of multiple PEs with its input and output buffer as well as accumulation of the partial sum from multiple PEs. And then one PE can be composed of multiple synaptic array and its input and output buffers as well as adder tree. So one synaptic array will have its own peripheral circuits as shown in this right-hand side figure. First, with this framework, we will analyze the ADC precision's impact as it is important to make sure the partial sum quantization from one array will not lose the information. So here we show the inference accuracy for CIFAR 10 data sets and we sweep the device precision from one bit to four bit per cell and then we sweep the synaptic array size from 64 by 64 up to 256 by 256. And also we consider the ADC precision from 3 bit to 5 bits. And we can see that in most cases, we need to use 5 bit ADC to ensure no significant drop of the accuracy. And here, the 5 bit ADC actually can tolerate up to 7 bits information loss. Why is that? If we consider the 256 rows, it represents 8 bits in full precision. Plus 4 bits per cell, in total, we have 12 bits information. But we can use 5 bit ADC for the quantization. This is reasonable for the CIFAR 10 dataset. But as we go to a larger dataset, such as ImageNet, we found out that we may need to use up to 8 bit ADC. So in that case, the ADC will be very expensive. And we may have to use a SAR ADC to trade off the throughput versus the area and the power. Now we can show the benchmark results for computing memory inference on CIFAR 10 data sets. First, we extract the device parameters from the literature and project those number of memories are integrated at 22 nanometer load, considering their latest industry availability. So here we can show that the emerging number of memories generally outperform the SRAN as the same technology load in terms of the energy efficiency. And to achieve the best energy efficiency, we need to improve the unstable resistance above 100 kilo ohm. And in this sense, FEFET is most promising because its unstable resistance can be modulated by the gate buyers. And also, we need to consider the latest CMOS technology, for example, the 7 nanometer SRAM can also achieve reasonably good energy efficiency and also the best computing efficiency. This is because the area scaling advantage. Therefore, this motivated us to further scale down the number of memory to more advanced technology load if we can reduce the program voltage for those memories. As mentioned earlier, it is challenging to directly use number of memory for in-situ training due to the nonlinearity and asymmetry in the weight update. So here is an alternative design based on the hybrid synapse, where the number of memory only stores the most significant bits, and the volatile capacitor will store the least significant bits, where the updates mostly happen in the LSBs. So we can charge and discharge this capacitor linearly and symmetrically 
as demonstrated here. But the capacitor is volatile, that means we have to transfer the weight from the LSB to the MSB once in a while. This will determine the transfer interval. And with the appropriate design of the transfer interval, we can ensure the training accuracy approach the software baseline. Our group proposed a compact hybrid precision synapse design based on the FE FET. So here the FE gate capacitance serves as the volatile memory for LSB, and the polarization states of the FE FET serves as non-volatile memory for MSB. The details of the design can be found in this IEDM 2018 paper. The figure on the right hand side shows the energy efficiency for different designs. We can see that First, generally, the hybrid precision synapse can outperform the pure non-volatile memory-based design in terms of the T-Ops per watt. And among the hybrid precision synapse, the FE-FET-based design achieves the best T-Ops per watt thanks to its lowest read and read energy compared to the other r run or m run based design. Two more design considerations for the hybrid synapse. First is the cap leakage. We need to make sure the leakage current through the access transistor below 10 femtoan to ensure the retention time above milliseconds and no training accuracy loss. This requires the DRAM-like transistor, and we believe that oxide channel transistor is a good candidate with ultra-low leakage and it can also provide large program voltage to write the non-volatile memory. Second, the endurance requirement actually can be relaxed for the hybrid synapse because most of the write happen on the charge and discharge of the capacitor instead of the writing non-volatile memory. Here, we count the number of writes for the image net can be as low as 20,000 times this is a really good news for many of the non-volatile memory candidates if we use it in the hybrid synapse fashion. Now let's move on to the chip level demonstrations for computing memory. Here is a survey of the industry platforms for emerging non-volatile memory. It should be pointed out that those platforms are developed mostly for the embedded memory applications, not necessarily the device characteristics are uh, tailored for the synaptic weight. So here for the R run, it is available at TSMC 40 nanometer and 22 nanometer, as well as Intel's 22 nanometer. FE FET is available at Global Foundry's 28 nanometer and 22 nanometer. PCM is also available at TSMC 40 nanometer. SDTM run available at Samsung 28, TSMC 22, Intel 22, and Global Foundry 22. This table summarized the R-RAN-based computing memory macros reported in the recent years, which integrate the ADC on chip. So here, as you can see, the energy efficiency is typically less than what the neural scene predicted, partly due to older technology load used in those macros, and also partly due to that the number of rows turned on in those macros are typically very limited as compared to the fully parallel computation used in the neural scene prediction. And also the accuracy is less than ideal software baseline in those macros due to the process variation, especially in the ADC offsets. Now we will discuss some design details of those representative chips. The first one was ISCC 2019 from National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. In this design, 1 megabit 1T1R run was integrated at 50 nanometer CMOS logic process with the integrated ADC based on the Martin level sense amplifier. In this design, probably because of the R run resistance is low to reduce the colon current, a downscaling weighted current translator was used to reduce the sensing current. As mentioned earlier, the process variation may degrade the inference accuracy 
So in this design, a small offset current mode sensor was employed to compensate the accuracy loss. This is an improvement from the same research group presented in ISCC 2020. This design was integrated at 22 nanometer process with 2 megabit R1. New design features such as input aware multi bit bitland clamping and tooth complement weight mapping was used. With the new design, close to software baseline accuracy was achieved, for example, 90% for CIFAR 10 data sets. Our group recently also designed a prototype chip for the RM based in memory compute with collaborators from Arizona State University. This design was tapered out with the Winbound's 90 nanometer RM process, and we have the integrated ADC with the peripheral circuits like the switch matrix MUX and so on. And this chip can enable the both positive and negative weight and also the positive and negative input. Therefore, it can perform the x nor computation. Here are the key features of this chip. Here we use 2T2R weight cell to represent the positive and negative weights. And also we use a complement word line to represent the positive and negative inputs. The truth table shows the effective resistance for the bitwise x nor computation. Where the LRS resistance represents the positive one output and HRS resistance represents the negative one output. Therefore, the combination of the HRS and LRS resistance can form the pull down network to determine the bitline voltage that is to be sensed by a 3 bit ADC made of the 7 voltage mode sense amplifier. Here we would like to show how we use this test chip to evaluate the inference accuracy. Essentially, we have to perform this mix software and hardware experiments, where the test chip will perform the MAC operations with the input vector and weight matrix, while the software will perform the neuron activation function and pooling. And we can use this approach to evaluate the impact of the process variation. For example, here, if we don't calibrate the references for the ADC, we use the common references for all the ADCs on chip, the inference accuracy will be very bad. But if we can calibrate the references for each individual ADC here, then we can boost the accuracy to 83.5%. But further, if we calibrate each individual SENSAMP reference, we do not see a significant improvement of the accuracy. This suggests that the degradation of the accuracy is mostly caused by the ADC offset instead from the colon to colon cell variations. We will move on to the last topic, modernistic 3D integration. Here are the challenges for the RM-based computing memory summarized from our chip design experience. First, today's RM typically has no unstate resistance. This requires a large end of max placed at the edge of the array to deliver the current current. Second, the RM programming voltage is typically high. That will lead to large cell area as well as poor area efficiency due to the level shifter. Also, the ADC consumes a lot of area and also the power. So here we see the breakdown of the power, 80% of the power is consumed by the ADC. And finally, we have the process variation. As mentioned earlier, the ADC offset will introduce the inaccurate partial sum computation. Therefore, eventually, the inference accuracy will be degraded from the software baseline. To address some of the design challenges, we propose modernistic 3D integration for RAM-based computing memory. This can be also generalized to other non-volatile memories as well. So the key idea is to partition the design into two tiers. The top tier will have the R1 and its nearest peripheral circuits at the legacy node, for example, 40 nanometer. 
where we can support the high programming voltage for the R1. And for the other logic transistor, as well as the ADCs, we can employ the more advanced technology node, such as 2816 or even beyond, as a bottom tier. And between the two tiers, we are going to use the massive inter-tier wires for the communication. So this design can open up the space as a bottom tier to allow more ADCs placed on chip. And also, we can employ the advanced offset cancellation techniques for the ADCs. One requirement for the monolithic 3D integration is that we need the backend of LAN compatible transistors at the top tier, which has compatible thermal budget for the fabrication. And we believe that the oxide channel transistor could be a good candidate for this purpose. To review the benefits of the monolithic 3D integration, here we show a case study to design a 2.4 megabit R1 computing memory tile. And here we employ the mixed signal EDA design flow, where we leverage the TSMC PDKs at different technology nodes, including the 40 nanometer, 28 nanometer, and 16 nanometer. And here we include all the necessary peripheral circuits in this chip hierarchy as shown here. And this is the synthesized basic layout using the 3D routing. The top row shows the 2D baseline design at 40 nanometer only, where all the digital circuits and the R1 and its peripheral circuits, including ADC, are placed on the same substrate. And then we can partition that into the 3D design, use a balanced area between the top tier and the bottom tier. And here in the bottom tier, we will have the digital circuits and the ADCs. On the top tier, we will have the R1 array and the level shifter and the analog max. Here I like to show the PPA analysis for the 2D baseline design versus the monolithic 3D design. And here we have two flavors of the 3D design. One is 40 nanometer on top and 28 nanometer on bottom. The other one is 40 nanometer on top and 16 nanometer on bottom. I will skip the details of the table, but I have to draw general conclusions here. First, since we have more space on the bottom tier to place more ADCs, the number of ADC can be increased by eight times. That means the throughput can be increased by eight times. The power will be increased by two times. As a result, the energy efficiency throughput divided by power can be increased by four times. At the same time, the chip footprint in the two-dimensional space can be reduced by 50%. Another metric I want to highlight is the inter-tier metal wires density is roughly 100K per millimeter square. This really requires the wear pitch to be on the order of 100 nanometer. This truly motivated the monolithic 3D integration. Heat dissipation is always a concern for monolithic 3D integration. Here we perform the ANSYS simulations to generate the thermal map of our proposed 3D design, and we show a very moderate temperature increase less than 10 degrees C. This is because of the low power density of the computing memory. And here we survey different types of the prototype chips. And uh, generally, they show a very low power density less than 0.1 watt per millimeter square. From our compact modeling, we can see that the temperature increase is very moderate. A few more words on the key enabler for monolithic 3D integration. That is the backend of LAN compatible oxide channel transistor. In this year's VLSI symposium, Professor Suman Data's group has demonstrated a tungsten doped ending oxide channel transistor with very good characteristics. I'd like to take this opportunity to advertise a few related works in the upcoming IEDM technical sessions. The first one is a 3D neural scene benchmark extension from our group. So here we benchmark the IWO transistor for the RM-based computing memory accelerators. For more details, please go to the paper 30.4.
Also, Professor Suman Data's group will present a backend online compatible FE FET for monolithic 3D integration. This is an integration of the IWO oxide channel with the HZO ferrinetric gate stack. This is a paper 36.4. All right, let's have a summary of this short course presentation. First, computing memory can save the intermediate data movements. Therefore, it can improve the throughput and energy efficiency for AI acceleration. Multi-bit non-volatile memory, including the R1 phase change memory, flash, as well as 3D land flash, and the emerging FE FET can be tuned to multi-level states, possibly by iterative read and verify. And we believe the read-intensive inference is the most suitable applications with advantages over S1, especially for the edge intelligence where the low standby leakage and the non-volatility is desired. And we believe FE FET is the most promising candidates with attractive features such as improved unstable resistance above 100 kilo ohm with the gate biasing and the low red energy approaching femtojoule per bit due to the field driven switching and fast read and write speed around tens of nanosecond and the high density integration potential with 2 to 5 bit per cell. We believe that the non-volatile memory-based inference engine chip design still face challenges such as high rate voltage, therefore we need the level shifter, and the low unstable resistance, ADC overhead, intermediate state stability, and process variation caused the inference accuracy degradation. And our group has developed the DNN plus Neurosyn benchmark framework that is open source to the research community and uh, this is uh, beneficial to benchmark different kinds of computing memory technologies. And we believe the 3D backnovelan integration could leverage the non-volatile memory at the legacy node while increase the benefits of the scaling of the logic transistor to the latest advanced technology node. With this, I'd like to thank my collaborators in the research, including Professor Suman Data and Asip Khan on the FE FET based design, and Professor Jason Seal on the RN tapeout, and Professor Sang Kyu Lin and Mahanad Bakir on the monolithic 3D design and the thermal analysis. Of course, I'd like to acknowledge my students and postdocs involved in the research. And this research is in part supported by National Science Foundation and the SRC Jump Program, SRC Encore Program, and especially the Ascent Center, which is one of the SRC DARPA research center under the SRC Jump Program. And we also attach the reference list to different topics involved in this presentation. So first is the review and the benchmark. Second is the RN-related design and the oscillation neuron. And third one is the FE FET. And the last one is 3D NAND and the hybrid synapse. I'd like to conclude my presentation here. Thank you for your attention.